Our speaker for this evening making a return visit is Vern Merton. He is a distinguished professor of humanities and a professor of history and computer science at Clemson University. This is only his latest stint. He spent 35 years in Illinois. He was at uh, Coastal Carolina for a bit. And he is a prolific author. He's authored or edited 16 books and 200 plus articles. Tonight he's going to discuss Lincoln and the Constitution, and then maybe a little bit more on it. So, Bert. It is a terrific honor to be back here in Milwaukee. If not my favorite, I think Charleston may be my favorite city. I believe Milwaukee is my second favorite. Uh, I really do love it. I love uh, Wisconsin. I want to call my daughter and son-in-law here with I made such good friends here before, particularly Judd, who uh, I have so much fun with. I have to be careful because we can talk all night long uh, and, and uh, just enjoy it so very, very much. So thank you all for having me back to talk about Lincoln and the Constitution. Now, uh, even though I have talked for many, many years, I still get nervous when uh, I get up to talk or even when I teach at a university. And I've argued you can take the boy out of the Southern Baptist denomination, but you can't take the Southern Baptist pension for prayer and distress and Bible reading out of it very well. So, even though I made it all the way to Presbyterian Elder at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and I really believe that if I had stayed those two more years when I would have maxed out my retirement, I think I'd have made Episcopalian because I was on my way up. <laughs> but uh, I still in fact have to grab a Bible and say a prayer before I get up to calm my nerves. And it was sort of remarkable to me to find out that the Bible here in Milwaukee reads a little bit different than it has anywhere else. I've read it, whether in Illinois or Clemson. Uh, and particularly, I just started to begin the create, creation story. It goes different. Uh, God is creating the world, at which point Jesus says, Mother, you've left out uh, 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 Milwaukee. Uh, Wisconsin. And God said, well, we'll make it up to them. We'll give them a wonderful city. We'll give them streams of water. We'll give them beautiful horses and horse trails and rolling hills and good farmland and cabbages. We'll give them a great lake. We'll even give them a root river and good fishing and good golfing and the best beer and terrific universities. And Jesus said, well, Mother, don't you think you're overdoing it a little bit? At which point God said, well, uh, not really when they find out who their neighbors are. <laughs> I really am one of those neighbors. So I did not wait to come in to Milwaukee and balance out the good things you have. Now perhaps I should preface my remarks by suggesting you might want to consider the source. This interpretation comes from someone whose judgment led him to be a historian of the American South for 34 years in Illinois and is now a Lincoln scholar in South Carolina. <laughs> I went home to found things have changed. People no longer like Lincoln there in the South. Uh, in the age of Lincoln, I argue that Abraham Lincoln was not only the greatest president and also a Southerner, coincidentally, but also I argue he was the greatest theologian of the 19th century. I spoke a little bit about this before, so I'm not going to talk about it today, so I'm going to begin with a, a quote and then a question. Lincoln knew his Bible so very, very well, and this is to help us think about Lincoln and the Constitution. It's from James 1, 25, from my second favorite book, after the age of Lincoln, actually it's my favorite book of the Bible, but we've got to press on in, in terms of Trying to sell books, of course. Uh, <laughs> but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedoms and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. That's from the New International Version. Now I'm going to pose a question for you to ponder. We're not going to talk about it tonight, because I've spoken here before about Lincoln and religion. But I think it's a good one. All of you are familiar with maybe the greatest political speech of all time, maybe the greatest of all, the second and of Lincoln's, where there he argues that God gave this war to North and South alike because we Americans had not handled this sin of slavery. Uh, how then 
if you think of the second inaugural, what he's saying there, does Lincoln's view of God actually uh, affect his reading of the Constitution? Maybe we can come to it in questions or not, uh, but uh, I want to get on to this now. Even before the bicentennial, when I first came to speak here, Lincoln was the most written about of all Americans. Only Jesus Christ and Shakespeare have more written about them than Abraham Lincoln. And I think after all the books I was asked to review during those two years of bicentennial, I got a feeling Shakespeare might be in trouble. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I had, and most historians always thought it was Napoleon who was in second place, but it really was Shakespeare. And I found this out from all sources, USA Today. USA Today interviewed me for well over two hours. My wife was there, uh, and uh, she heard the whole the whole interview, and the whole time I was trying to explain that of course Lincoln was racist, everybody was racist, it was a racist age, he used the N-word, but Lincoln was less racist than others. And certainly he was less racist than any politician who had a chance to be elected president. And the great thing about Lincoln is that he changed as he met African Americans, he experienced African Americans, he, he changed and moved forward in race relations, a good example. And USA Today had one sentence at our over two, eight, two hour interview that said, University of Illinois professor Orville Vernon Burton claims Lincoln is racist. <laughs> so you have to be careful, in fact, uh, of what you hear. And uh, uh, that's not what I'm saying I'm not going to talk about tonight, but I am going to talk about the, the Constitution. Now, during these two years of the bicentennial, there was witnessed an amazing amount of Lincoln activity. Some asked, why was there so much hoopla about Abraham Lincoln? How is Lincoln relevant to us today? That is, the American people have to work out their livelihoods and pay their bills. White Northerners certainly think of Abraham Lincoln as the president who saved the Union. White Southerners used to think of the war leader who held malice toward none. African Americans once thought of Lincoln as the great emancipator but increasingly perceiving him as just another white racist. <coughs> Whatever our views, I think, though, there's a Lincoln who is truly an enduring figure, one who speaks to us in our own time, and nowhere better than when we look at the Constitution of the United States. And when I wrote The Age of Lincoln, I was interested in Lincoln's legacy and an answer to a question that I'll rephrase from one of President Bill Clinton's more infamous lines. Rather than worrying about what the meaning of the word is, is, I'm interested in what the meaning of us is. Lincoln is about us, that is you it, who we are. In April 13, 2009, now the former editor of Newsweek, John Meekham, argued that, and I quote, Americans value freedom and free or largely free enterprise. The foundational documents are the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Without acknowledging and maybe not aware of it, Meekham, I think, was explaining the most important influences on Lincoln also. When looking at Lincoln and the Constitution, you have to understand that Lincoln was an attorney. And his legal background in Illinois influenced his interpretations of the time and certainly of the Constitution. On 27th January 1838, men in Springfield, Illinois, braved the winter weather to attend the Young Men's Lyceum a public meeting where they were audience to talented speakers performing their rhetoric and eloquence on a wide assortment of topics. The speaker that evening was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives and a new resident of Springfield, Illinois, having recently moved from the frontier town of Salem. Disturbed by a recent mob violence in Mississippi and the city of St. Louis, as well as the killing of abolitionist editor Elijah Lovejoy in Illinois, 28-year-old Abraham Lincoln was delivered a speech on, quote, the perpetuation of our political institutions. Displaying the loquaciousness he would prune in subsequent years, the state representatives state the nation's future on, quote, a reverence for the Constitution and law. And in the draft, Lincoln italicizes that and underlines it himself, for which he recommended that every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. The young Lincoln called on Americans to renew their patriotic attachment to sober reason, law and order, and the political advocacy of liberty and equal rights bequeathed them by their forebears. All too aware of human frailties, Lincoln readily granted the existence of bad laws, a 
of grievances for which, quote, no legal provision had been made. This political religion that Lincoln espoused was necessarily a never-ending exercise, a halting process to a greater justice, not perfection. Bad laws were being repealed and new laws, new legal provisions applied to new grievances. <coughs> quote, reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason was the bedrock for America's future support and defense. Here was boundless commitment to, if not necessarily blind faith in general intelligence, sound morality, and reverence for the rule of law, especially the United States Constitution. And on his strengths, this 28-year-old Lincoln was prepared to assert that even, quote, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He keeps reworking this speech until he gets the wording absolutely right. This is Abraham Lincoln's actually first recorded political speech. Slightly over two decades later, Lincoln's early stated belief in the rule of law would be tested and the fate of the nation, and I would argue the fate of what we think of a representative or elected government, depended on his interpretation of the American Constitution. During his early foray into politics in the Illinois General Assembly and in one term as U.S. Congressman, Lincoln was a Whig in favor of internal improvements. His views on the matter were those of Federalist founding fathers Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall, or later Whigs, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. While Whigs called for federal support for new enterprises, such as road canals and railroads, Southern slaveholders disagreed. They considered that the Constitution did not allow such expansion of federal authority. More the point maybe was a statement by North Carolina Senator Nathaniel Macon who succinctly explained, quote, if Congress can make banks, roads, and canals under the Constitution, they can free any slave in the United States. Because Lincoln revered the Declaration of Independence and he spoke highly of Jefferson, and because both Jefferson and Lincoln, in fact, are seen as champions of liberty and expanding liberty, liberty and both are seen as representative of the common man, I think we have too often tried to see Lincoln as a 19th century Jeffersonian, but Lincoln was never a strict constructionist. How Lincoln and his contemporaries interpreted the Constitution has to be understood in the context of the growth of capitalism in the 19th century and what new extremes of wealth meant for tenuous democracy in this young republic. Now, I had taught Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin for probably 25 years, but when I reread it while writing The Age of Lincoln, I realized Uncle Tom's Cabin was not just an indictment of slavery, but also was an indictment of greed within a growing system of American capitalism. Uh, as I was doing my own research, I became amazed that people in the United States were worried about the United States holding together not so much about slavery. Slavery had begun as a national institution, but they were more worried, in fact, about the addition of Western states. By Western states, they meant Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois because they saw them as different, with different values and different interests. Sectional conflict for men between East and West more than, in fact, between North and South. It was not too later that slavery comes into the worry about how the Union will survive. Intellectuals expressed great anxiety over unfettered capitalism, especially over the resultant increase in wealth of a few. And working class people were appalled by new working relationships as they moved from the farms and into factories. Factories with wage labor replaced artisan households, and owners and bosses physically removed themselves from their employers. The growing disparity in wealth made some wonder if this young republic, founded on principles of equality and liberty, however imperfectly implemented, could survive. Increased immigration of different sorts of people, many not evangelical Protestants, most of whom worked for wages and were not property owners, was another concern. The pursuit of mammon at the expense of all else became a major theme of the literature that a quest for wealth would come at the expense of a virtuous citizenship and concern for country. What would be the effect on the United States Constitution if the expansion of the electorate included the profits and those beholden to others for their income? Lincoln's belief in freedom led him to deny the equation of voting rights with property holding, which had been rooted in the political philosophy of his idol, the Whig champion Henry Clay. That step across class lines was an enormous one, too easily overlooked in our own age when all may vote, but the control of wealth so vitally determined who runs for office 
who wins and who interests are served thereby. Lincoln's whippery was thoroughgoing in race relations also. Whatever private prejudices he may have harbored, Lincoln loathed the artificial bond society and government placed on the individual's ability to work hard and accumulate property. Abraham Lincoln saw the Constitution and the Republican form of government as offering freedom to rise upward. After one term only in Congress, Lincoln retired from politics and concentrated on his law practice to support his family. But the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 pulled him back into the national debate. Lincoln could not tolerate the move away from Thomas Jefferson's acceptance of slavery as a necessary evil to the view that it was a positive good as spoken of by John C. Calhoun on the U.S. Senate floor in the last part of the 1830s. Calhoun moved the debate, and those like Lincoln who could live with slavery if they believed it was dying out could not accept the idea that it was a positive good needed for others. Now, it's interesting, after teaching and living 34 years in the land of Lincoln, I now teach at Clemson University, which is founded on the plantation of none other than John C. Calhoun. And it's founded by none other than Pitchfork Ben Tilton, who is usually seen as the first in the stereotypical racist demagogue, someone who used race to motivate particularly uh, lower class whites to exclude blacks and to lead in segregation and became sort of the caricature of the southern demagogue later. And where do they put my office? No other than in the Strom Thurmond Institute. <laughs> so I have friends who ask me, Vernon, have you really gone to the dark side these days? <laughs> well, the 1850s imploded. The Compromise of 1850, problematic from the outset, included the passage of an aggressive fugitive slave act. The difficulty for whites trying to hold on to their enslaved workers had been addressed from the very beginning of the United States. To reclaim foot lease property, not to mention justify owners, slave owners could turn to the Constitution of the United States. Now the Constitution does not use the word slavery, but Article 4 states that, quote, no person held a service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Now with the Compromise of 1850, white slave owners demanded and got assurance of vigorous enforcement, requiring Northern whites to assist government enforcement agents and slave bounties. Increasingly, this Whig turned into a Republican. Abraham Lincoln thought that the Democratic Party was subverting the common good. You have these quotes from Lincoln that I love. Quote, our Republican robe is spoiled. The 4th of July is a good day for firecrackers. We once declared all men equal. Now it's the time to go to Russia where despotism can be taken pure. Now while these statements reveal Lincoln as a defender of the revolutionary tradition, he was always constrained by the rule of law that was held in the Constitution laid out in that first political speech that I, I shared with you. Lincoln accepted the Fugitive Slave Act as duly passed by Congress, although he did ask for a modification to ensure that free people were not kidnapped and enslaved. It was because of his support of the Fugitive Slave Law that the reformer Wendell Phillips called him that slave hound of Illinois. His reliance on the Constitution was severely tested in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution of the Dred Scott case in 1857. Though on the dark side of the historical ledger, Justice Tony was present in his grasp of whether certain assumptions led. Tony listed some of the rights that would be due African Americans if they were indeed citizens, ironically foreshadowing the post-war constitutional amendments. Just so Tony feared that citizenship is a long quote, so bear with me, but I thought it was interesting uh, in terms of his interpretation of what would happen if he had found African Americans to be citizens. It would give to persons of the Negro race who were recognized as citizens in any one state of the Union the right to enter every other state whenever they please, singly or in company, without pass or passport, and without obstruction, to sojourn there as long as they please, to go where they please at every hour of the day or night without molestation, unless they committed some violation of law for which a white man would be punished. And it would give them the full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects upon which its own citizens might speak, to hold public meetings upon political affairs and to keep and carry arms wherever they went. 
In the Dred Scott case, slavery had won a sweeping victory. Not only did the South hold a majority in Congress and the power of the executive, now the highest court of the land had overwhelmingly interpreted the Constitution to say that the peculiar institution was not peculiar at all. Indeed, it was a national institution, tampered with slavery, Tony implied, and all property rights were jeopardized. The enslaved had no claim to the law, and the enslaver no limits upon his just rights anywhere in the nation. There were no slave states and free states. All of America was a slaveholding republic, so it always would remain absent specific constitutional provisions to the contrary. Now, Dred Scott cut away the broad middle ground of political compromise upon which the two-party system had matured in the of America. At this turning point in history, when compromise would no longer rule the day, dramatic change was summed up by then a Senate candidate in Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. In 1858, Lincoln laid out with bold words the full implications of Dred Scott. While Northerners thought that slavery was dying out, he declared, now they would be forced to accept slavery in the North. While they believed people in neighboring Missouri were, quote, on the verge of making their state free, the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. Ultimately, however, the decision rested not with the court, but with the people, he asserted, a trick of logic and rhetoric which wed Democrat, his enemy, Stephen Douglas's popular sovereignty claim to the abolitionist notion of higher law. Quote, either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it, Lincoln explained, or its advocates will push it forward till it should become a light lawful in all the states. The court's ruling had only heightened, not ended, the conflict over slavery. A house divided against itself, he concluded, cannot stand. You have to understand when Lincoln says that, that is actually, you know, straight out of the Bible. And, of course, he's talking about Satan. And so it, you can see the strong implication when people knew their Bible and what he was saying and how he was condemning slavery and, and Southerners about that. While Lincoln dissented vigorously with the Dred Scott rule, his political opponent, Democrat Stephen A. Douglas, argued that Tony's decision accorded fully and correctly with America's racial essence. Quote, I am free to say to you that in my opinion, this government of ours is founded on the white basis. It was made by the white man for the benefit of the white man to be administered by white men in such manner as they should determine, end of quote. You well know that Douglas beat Lincoln in the race for U.S. Senator from Illinois. And I guess uh, you probably, I don't know how many of you grew up like I did here about how Lincoln lost all these elections and then gets to be president. Made me feel good as a kid when I lost the election because Lincoln's vote. You know, Lincoln was very proud. It was only his very first election where the people had the vote that he only lost. When the people had the direct vote, he actually won every time. So his very first one, he was barely 23 years of age. So it's not quite the same thing that the sort of myth has it. You also know how the debates, the Lincoln Douglas debate, brought Lincoln into the national deliberation on slavery and won in the nomination for a Republican candidate for president. Now, I ask students about the Lincoln Douglas debate. What do they know? Here's what they tell me. Well, Lincoln is this tall dude, he's six foot four, and Douglas is short, squat, fat little fellow like you, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I say, who cares? These two men were debating two visions of America. And Lincoln is actually, if you understand the context of times and what Illinois was like, is challenging Douglas, who is much more in line with the rest of Illinois and America, and not like Lincoln. It was a very racist context at time. So if you understand that, you understand a lot about how heroic it was, despite his own racism, that Lincoln takes this line of argument against Douglas. Lincoln's anti-slavery sentiments were fervent and real, and such formulations go far to explaining why Southerners, that is white Southerners, and a significant cluster of Northern Democrats as well, saw Lincoln's elevation of the presence as a dangerous revolutionary step. Yet if successors were interested in protecting slavery, they shouldn't have feared Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln strove repeatedly in 1860 to allay fears that his party aimed at dismantling slavery. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, he promised, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. The presidents conveyed no such power, he asserted, and the Constitution permitted no such meddling. Quote, I believe I have no lawful right to do so, he allowed, adding, and I have no inclination to do so. At Cooper Union in New York in early 1860, he called for adherence to the Constitution, and Lincoln assured all that the rule of law constrained him no less 
that he expected to constrain his fellow Americans. In office also, President Lincoln views the Constitution were critical to his decision to preserve the Union. The Constitution created a nation, and to rip it apart was lawless anarchy as well as unconstitutional. Lincoln believed the Constitution prevented him from caving in to what the secessionists wanted. Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address given on 4 March 1861, two weeks after Jefferson Davis was sworn in as the South leader, speaks plainly about the issues of succession. Sounding like a contract lawyer, Lincoln used the Constitution itself as evidence against the legality of this union. If the United States be not a government proper, he asked, by an association of states in the nature of contract merely, can it as a contract be peacefully unmade by less than all the parties who made it? Clearly not. One party to a contract may violate it, break it, so to speak, but does it not require all to lawfully rescind it? Violated, broken, the Union still remained unabolished. Lincoln pleaded with the South to reconsider his rash actions, refusing all responsibility for what, might, what, for what might come next. In only another four years, a short time, he pointed out, those dissatisfied might elect the president more to their liking. Ultimately, Lincoln resolved not to allow the rebellious state to succeed. I wholly declare that in contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. Lincoln found that no state upon its own mere notion can lawfully get out of the union, that resolves and ordinance to that effect are legally void, and that acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances. After Lincoln's election, and after decades of trying to keep the slavery question out of the national region, secessionists now could hardly stop shouting that they had broken up the Union to save their peculiar institution. For the most part, however, the ordinance of secession themselves were simple. They stated that, quote, the Constitution of the United States of America is no longer binding on any of the citizens of the state. Quoting language of the Declaration of Independence, which announced why the original 13 colonies felt the need to succeed from Great Britain in 1776, the seceding states declared their preference for a new government, quote, on such principles and organize its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, rationale from this point of view relied on the work of South Carolina's dominant political leader and political theorist John C. Calhoun again. Ironically, According to Lincoln's closest friend, Joshua Speed, Lincoln, quote, was a great admirer of the style of John C. Calhoun, he meant the writing style. Lincoln wanted to persuade people through his rhetoric, and he studied Calhoun's writing, even preferring the Carolinian style over his beau ideal, Henry Clay. Until his death in 1850, Calhoun has struggled with the problem of sectional conflict. He has described the South Carolina's right to abolish federal laws during the nullification crisis in 1830. And Democratic President Andrew Jackson put Calhoun on notice at a dinner celebrating Jefferson Day. He toasted, Our union, it must be preserved. Calhoun responded to Jackson's challenge and offered the next toast. The union next to our liberty, most dear. Privately, Jackson threatened to hang Calhoun. When Jackson dispatched a fleet of eight ships and a shipment of 5,000 muskets to South Carolina, the state responded by organizing militia regiments across the state. Calhoun's brinkmanship paid off for Henry Clay, the great compromiser, and who, in fact, uh, Lincoln wanted to model himself after, worked out the lower tariff. No other state supported South Carolina's dare at that time. In 1849, Calhoun hammered out his view of the state-federal government relationship and his disposition to govern. It is federal and not national because it is the government of a community of states and not the government of a single state or nation, accordingly that a state as a party to the constitutional compact has a right to succeed, acting in the same capacity to which it ratified the Constitution, cannot with any show of reason be denied by anyone who regards the Constitution as a compact. Calhoun's word. Ultimately, succession, though, is a matter of power, and the election of Abraham Lincoln signaled that a minority of people from a sectional political party could decide the presidency. In declaring succession, Alabama, among others, raised just this issue that the election of Abraham Lincoln showed that victory, and I quote, by a sectional party, avowedly hostile to the domestic institutions, meaning slavery, and to the peace and security of the people of the state of Alabama, preceded by many and dangerous infractions of the Constitution of the United States by many of the states and people of the northern section, is a political wrong of so insulting 
and menacing of characters to justify the people of the state of Alabama in the adoption of prompt and decided measures for their future peace and security. End of the long quote. The newly sovereign Southerners, instead of taking practical measures to secure Southern independence, worked out a viable policy towards the Upper South and established a satisfactory foreign policy set specifically about writing a new constitution. This was for two reasons. First, the Confederates felt compelled to defend their treason by calling upon the United States Constitution. The Constitution was a pure and good document, the Confederate declared, but it had been betrayed and sullied by, quote, the black Republicans of the North. Second, the Constitution was seen as almost holy in the making of the United States, and Confederates, too, were Americans, and were, of course, very much involved, uh, Southerners, in the making of the, of the United States. And they believed uniquely, that as Americans, uniquely believed that a Constitution created a nation very different than other nations where you have everybody of sort of the same ethnic background, uh, same history, things like that. The argument that this Confederacy uh, going to write a Constitution re first reflects the immature enthusiasm gripping the South, and they misread the central purposes of the moderate white Southern men who controlled this new nation. The new Constitution they drafted was never, I think, intended as a viable instrument of government. It served primarily as a list of rents to the men Southerners intended to gain from the Union as a condition for reunification. Indeed, the Confederate Constitution is noteworthy for its attempt to mirror the American Constitution and the restraint from which it seeks to alter it. And uh, I, on this website, I have ageoflincoln.com, and if some of you need to leave before we finish or anything, you can go there and email me at any time. I like to put the two constitutions side by side so you can see how similar they are. I believe that Confederates carefully wrote this Constitution with the intent that it become the basis for reconciliation because however much they hunger for more, rebels omitted mention of such deal breakers as real in the transatlantic slave trade for the fear of upsetting the bargain they hoped to make. The Montgomery document was achieved by, quote, each state acting in sovereign and independent characters, preamble note. Any rewriting of the American Constitution would have to proceed on the same basis. They argued that their freedom or for those who read closely, the price of reunification meant that property, and slavery otherwise, would be protected. States' rights would be paramount, and the Southern way of life would not be under siege. The Constitution of the United States dealt with the slave issue, uh, but only the Confederate Constitution called it by name, including a provision in its Article 4, remember we read it earlier, which it used the word slave, quote, the institution of Negro slavery as it now exists in the Confederate state shall be recognized and protected by Congress and by the territorial government. And the inhabitants of the several Confederate states and territories shall have the right to take such territory, any slaves lawfully held by them in any of the states or territories of the Confederate state. This was essentially the language of the constitutional amendment Congress had so recently passed, except Congress did not include the indispensable territorial protection. Remember that we have the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. But there was an original 13th Amendment that Lincoln himself was willing to sign that guaranteed that slavery could continue to exist where it already existed, just it would not be allowed to expand. So the states that had slavery like South Carolina would have a constitutional guarantee that no time would the federal government interfere with slavery. Confederates included it in their document book to indicate their central demand and suggest how simple and minor such a broad change can be made to seem. Both the Constitution of the Confederate States of America and the Constitution of the United States seek to, quote, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and secure the blessings to ourselves and our posterity. Ironically, one of the particular points of difference regarding the issue of succession. The U.S. Constitution says nothing about permits, though our Confederation did. But the Confederate States of America preamble specifically specified, quote, in order to form a permanent federal government, thereby supposedly precluding other future succession. Now, the great irony that people who succeed write their constitutions that you can't succeed from the new one. Uh, if a minority succeeds, Lincoln re reasoned, and Lincoln saw this, I think, as, as a constitutional lawyer, saw the problem. If a minority succeeds, Lincoln reasoned, quote, they make a precedent which in turn will divide and ruin them. For a minority of their own will succeed from them whenever a majority refuse to be controlled by such minority. 
If secession was legal then, why may not any portion of a new confederacy a year or two hence arbitrarily succeed again? Precisely as portions of the present union now claim to succeed from them. All who cherish disunion sentiments are now being educated to the exact temper of doing this. But war came. With body, mounts count, with body counts mounting, Lincoln's goal was no longer to plead his case, it was to win a war. Lincoln did not take this literal interpretation of the Constitution, nor think of the Constitution as a straight jacket on presidential power. People who want to decry Lincoln's policies are unwilling to admit that interpretation of the Constitution can vary. Alternative interpretation of constitutional power can exist as part of an ongoing conversation about presidential power. Anything he needed to do with anything he needed to do to win, he took the authority to do. In early 1863, the National Bank provided for a supervised system of national banks, unthinkable in the years of democratic ascendancy. More than $300 million in new treasury bills, greenback dollars, were pumped out through the doors into the broader economy. As with the whole package of Republican fiscal measures, Legislators and private citizens gravely doubt the constitutionality of funding paper money backed by promises alone through the mechanism an earlier era Democrats had labeled the monster bank. But it was necessary. A national income tax, only temporary, helped finance the war. Everything was a war measure. Advocates assured the community. A desperate course to be sure yet necessary and proper under the circumstances and destined to end once the rebellion was vanquished. Efforts to trace the roots of an imperial presidency back to Lincoln usually point the cavalier way in which the former Illinois lawyers sometimes dealt with questions of civil liberties. In muting support for succession in the border state, Republicans had no qualms about using methods of intimidation. Threatened Maryland and Kentucky politicians with summary arrest and confinement should they lend their forces in favor of this union and station impressive military garrisons in crucial centers of doubtful loyalty. Lincoln's fiercest critic condemned his suspension of habeas corpus. Careful scholars as well as libertarians and neo-confederates berate Lincoln for his abuse of the Constitution during the Civil War. When Lincoln first took over, he violated the Constitution on numerous occasions. He did not have the power to arrest pro-secession legislators, to arrest pro-secession editors, to revoke habeas corpus, to call out 75,000 soldiers, or to order weapons without the express consent of Congress. His excuse, as he said himself, was that he was violating some small laws in the Constitution to save the whole Constitution. Lincoln uh, used to tell people, if you have gangrene on your leg or arm, do you let the whole body die or do you amputate it? Or another one of his favorite statements was, you expect me to uh, you have me shoot a boy of 17 for desertion in the army, but we do nothing about the people who are advocating this and telling him to do this, the newspaper editors and others. Lincoln could have called Congress into session, although it would have taken almost two weeks for all of them to arrive. Nevertheless, he chose not to call them in until the next session began months later. The rump Congress did endorse his actions, but critics argued that he continued to revoke habeas corpus in areas where no military threat existed. Habeas corpus powers only stated in Article I of the Constitution, which concerns itself solely with the powers of the legislative branch. One of the most vitriolic anti-Lincoln arguments goes like this. Some say his excuse for ignoring the Constitution in early 1861 is the same excuse which Hitler gave in 1934 with the Enabling Act. Please, I think it's important to remember that Lincoln detained some people by temporarily suspending the writ of habeas corpus. That's not the same as murdering 12 million people. Lincoln hardly ran a dictatorship. Lincoln was conscious of the limitation of his powers as president, and while aggressive about using power, he rarely suppressed free speech. He accepted denunciation and attack by the opposition press frequently throughout his presidency. The people who could produce aid, the Illinois aid, are the Illinois guerrilla, Abraham Africanus I, and American Bastille, had certainly easy access to the public to spread their views. It is true that in places of disorder, the military arrested people, but these were usually temporary events and reflective of what was occurring in a local <coughs> environment, and the people arrested were later released. Suspension of habeas corpus was most prevalent within the crucial border state where no firm consensus existed as to whether North or South upheld the right in the national court. 
Lincoln realized the danger in the war's first days as rioting mobs in Baltimore pelted Union regiments, moving through the street and disrupted railroad travel toward the battlefront. His efforts to curb such resistance included overzealously abandoning civil liberties, but danger to the Union effort was real. In Kentucky and Missouri, even in the northern states like Indiana, Southern sympathizers worked to disrupt federal efforts and intimidate potential Union recruits. Dark land societies like the Knight of the Golden Circle rallied Confederate loyalists in the North and comforted anti-war politicians like Ohio's Clement Vallandigham. Lincoln undeniably gave short shrift to rights of free speech in deporting Vallandigham. In May 1863, with Union military fortunes at their lowest ebb, General Ambrose Burnside, commander of the military district of Ohio, ordered Vallandigham to be brought before an army tribunal. He was convicted of uttering disloyal sentiments and sentenced to two years in prison. In February 1864, a federal appeals court affirmed that the president had not exceeded the war powers allowed him under the Constitution that the nation might be properly divided up into military district and administered by soldiers under a distinct body of law when entirely unchallenged. That civilian courts had no right to compel military officials to obey the doctor habeas corpus was affirmed. In pursuit of military triumph, it seemed the commander-in-chief might set aside the Constitution itself. Nor was this sweeping legal victory enough for Lincoln. Anxious to avoid turning the loud mouth of Landingham into a political martyr, he arranged for him to be expelled across Confederate lines. But Landingham refused to be silenced, silenced, and he traveled back to Canada, insisting all along he acted in defense of the Constitution and free speech against those who would enslave American citizens. He ran for the governorship of Ohio on the Democratic ticket in 1864 and lost by a landslide. Wartime Americans, then like today, like with the Patriot Act, seem to care much more about order, security, and military victory than any minor infringements on the rights and liberties of marginal political activists. That choice, however, popular, carried with it devastating consequences for advocates of social change in generations to come. Like most true believers confronted by intransient opponents, Lincoln magnified the danger he faced from a most efficient corps of spies and former suppliers and aiders and abettors of the college, even as he crushed it out. Although Lincolnites labeled anti-democrats, copperheads after deadly poison stakes, their actions and arguments ranged from the spectrum of political action from opportunist anti-republicanism to pro-confederate racism to principled defiance of what looked to them like presidential tyranny. In some cases, big talk overflowed into subversive plotting. In 1864-5, Indiana members of the Sons of Liberty were arrested for scheming to launch a Harper's Ferry, John Brown-style raid on a northern prisoner of war camp. Attorney Landon P. Milligan and his followers of the seized control of the state government and carry Indiana out of the war. Instead, a military court martial sentenced the harebrained conspirators to hang and they doubtless would have had not the Supreme Court intervened in December 1868, 66. Ex-Partray Milligan to remain silent on whether the president might suspend habeas corpus, independent of congressional support, but ruled that citizens could not be tried by military authority where civilian courts were functioning. In dozens of cases where Army Provost Marshal had held Copperhead for long periods without charge then, the detentions were deemed legal, though military prosecutions such as Vallandigham had faced were ruled invalid. As disturbing as expatriate Milligan seemed to some, it fit well with the broad warlord-like powers Lincoln wielded in struggle against the Confederate South. Republicans used federal marshals, <laughs> Lincoln detectives, and agents of the newly formed U.S. Secret Service to silence political opponents as well as Confederate spies. While Lincoln took an unprecedented hands-on approach to war making, goaded and advised his generals on tactical point, he demonstrated little desire to intervene when his commanders abridged civil liberties or political rights in pursuit of military success. The hard war policies of General William Sherman and Philip Sheridan waged war against the Southern citizenry that his government aroused no complaint on his part. Neither did he intervene in 1864 when Maryland rewrote its state constitution to disfranchise slaveholders. Anti-war Democrats and draft riders were more than assorted crackpots, traitors, and racists. Certainly their ranks were swelled by such type, yet their arguments held truths also. The President, the Congress, and the courts did ride roughshod on civil liberty. Although Lincoln is celebrated for the new birth of freedom we'll talk about later, his administration sponsored 
that tribe went hand in hand with the provision of civil rights and an expansive notion of executive power. Dissension, though, also believed Jefferson Davis throughout his tenure as president of the Confederacy. Governor Zulu Vance of North Carolina, Joseph Brown of Georgia, and Pendleton Murr of Texas refused to accept Confederate national authority. Davis also had various pockets of pro unionism Stonewall Jackson had put down a local Blue Ridge Rebellion of several hundred in Virginia. Although Davis downplayed his autocratic response in relation to that of Lincoln, their reactions were very similar. In an address to the Confederate Congress on the 22nd of February, 1862, Jefferson Davis contrasted the Confederacy's refusal to restrict, quote, personal liberty or the freedom of speech or the thought or of the press with Lincoln's abuse of these same rights. Five days later, however, the Congress gave Davis the authority to declare martial law, and he was quick to suspend habeas corpus and order the arrest of the sinners in areas seething with pro-Union citizens. Davis declared martial law in Norfolk, Portsmouth, Richmond, and Petersburg, Virginia. He suspended civil liberties in eastern Tennessee, which was an open rebellion against the Confederacy. The Confederate Vice President, Alexander Stevens, who actually came very close to being in Lincoln's cabinet, uh, from Georgia condemned Davis' suspension of habeas corpus as military despotism. Better to lose a war, the Vice President of the Confederacy declared earnestly, than to lose, quote, constitutional liberty at home. One of the war powers that Lincoln commandeered more slowly than the abolitionists demanded was emancipation. With his reliance on the Constitution as a rationale for waging war, Lincoln was hesitant to end the constitutionally sanctioned system of slavery. Lincoln had always hoped, loosely perhaps, that slaveholders would give up their slaves voluntarily and be recompensed by the government. He feared and was told by his best friend, the slaveholding Kentuckian Joshua Speed, that if he freed the slaves, Kentucky would join the Confederate effort. Now, Abraham so Lincoln supposedly said that he wanted God on his side, but he had to have Kentucky. Uh, really, uh, the border states of Kentucky was key. If Kentucky went, then went Maryland, Delaware, etc. Uh, Lincoln was afraid that Union forces would actually set down their arms and walk out of the fields and ask to fight for freeing the slaves instead of preserving the Union. Uh, one of my, my favorite stories at the beginning of the war, uh, Garibaldi uh, is, is asked to command Union troops. And you know, Garibaldi is a hero of two nations, he was called. It. It's hard to imagine. So, so in our day, we celebrate sports and be like a great sports hero. You know, he was celebrated by North and South alike. And when they asked Garibaldi, uh, would he take charge of American troops, it's unclear if he was offered all of them or part of was offered, Garibaldi asked, well, is this just a civil dispute between sections, or is this about ending slavery and liberty? He was assured it was only preserving the Union. He said, well, I'm not interested in if it's about the Union, but if it's about ending slavery, it's a different thing. And I think to explain partly what was going on with Lincoln, we don't realize how close we came to losing constitutional, democratic, people-elected government. Uh, the American Revolution has set in motion uh, other revolutions where people would govern themselves, the French Revolution throughout. But what happens? Napoleon takes over and returns. You had all the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. They failed. Monarchy is on the rise. Uh, democracy is, is, is on the defensive. Uh, the Latin American uh, democracies are all failing. Napoleon III from France put Maximilian on the throne in Mexico. Garibaldi reunites Italy, but instead of becoming a democracy, it sets up a monarchy instead of a republican democracy. So it looks like the South is on the side of where history is going, not the Union. And I think that you have to understand that context of what Lincoln thought he was striving for when he talks about the last best hope and opportunity. That if this war failed, that what we think of now as liberty and freedom would not be there where people could elect represent and have representative government. So needless to with the war going somewhat badly for the good guys, the commander in chief had to do something, and freedom for those very workers who were keeping the Confederate fields planted and harvesting certainly had a wartime justification. Lincoln discussed freedom, but not emancipation when he presented the Gettysburg Address in November 1863. Lincoln made no reference to the struggle of centuries, going passing from four score and seven years ago to now, 
In the recount, how the forefathers had mortgaged the bright promise of freedom in America's birth, how the boldest words against slavery had been stricken out of the Declaration of Independence as deal breakers, how the Articles of Confederation turned a blind eye to bondage, the constitutional framers, with no hope of achieving unity, the legislators uprooting had written racial division into the fundamental law of the land. Enslaved blacks asserted the U.S. Constitution were only three-fifths human when it came to reckoning, taxation, and political representation. Statute law and simple racism ranked both free and enslaved African Americans lower still. By 1863, Thomas Jefferson's self-evident truth about human equality had become the Lincoln's generation a very debatable proposition. Once emancipation had been accomplished, first by presidential proclamation, then ratified by the votes of state and federal representatives, the broader question arose, what could America not do? Were there any real limits to the power of the president and the Congress? Despite the American love affair with checks and balances, was there any real safety from government tyranny and such self-satisfying forms? Such questions were not entirely due to the Civil War years, but under the least administration that assumed an urgency and a difficulty earlier observers had hardly imagined. Now, it's interesting, I've tried to lay out these arguments about succession and slavery. I don't know how many of you know, but the reason Jefferson Davis was never put on trial was because the, uh, the, the Republicans feared that succession would be found legal. So that's why Davis was never tried or anyone else in this argument. And it's not until 1869, and I can't remember the name of the Texas case, when Salmon Chase, who is the uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, uses the exact same argument of Lincoln to say that succession is not legal. Of course, the Civil War decided that, but legally it was not until 1869. And I love to think, you know, Abraham Lincoln uh, really did not like Salmon Chase. He got along with almost everybody, but Salmon Chase was a thorn in his side. He tried to undermine him in every attempt. He had to dismiss it from his cabinet. And then when he uh, appointed a new Supreme Court justice, he appointed Salmon Chase. All his friends wanted this job, and Lincoln liked more than his friends. But he, he said, I would rather have swallowed my buckhorn chair than appoint Salmon Chase. But he did. And he did, I think, for two reasons. One, he knew that on black rights where Lincoln had moved extraordinarily toward black citizenship, that Salmon Chase would be a champion forever. And secondly, the two of them had the same ideas on legal ideas about succession. And those were two things I think that were really important for him to guarantee. Well, in conclusion, I want to examine how Lincoln changed the Constitution. The Emancipation Proclamation led to the last policy initiative of the Lincoln administration to pass the 13th Amendment. Judd Ju and I have talked about this. Lincoln really changed from a statement to a politician to lobby for the 13th Amendment. He really did believe in the separation of power. And this is the first time you really see Lincoln involved in lobbying Congress in such ways. Had, uh, he actually feared that the Emancipation Proclamation as an act of war might not hold up and might be revoked. So he buttonholed congressmen, gave political plums, and traded to get that 13th Amendment passed through Congress. Now historians have popularized the idea of the American Civil War as the second American Revolution. If we understand the Civil War as a continuation of the ideas unleashed in the American Revolution, then Lincoln, I think, is that prism through which the legacy of the Revolution are brought into play in the years leading up to the Civil War and to the war itself, as well as the consequences of that second American Revolution. The Declaration of Independence inspired the American Revolution, and I see the Declaration of Independence as our mission statement. The Constitution of the United States is our rule book. Lincoln who believed in the Declaration of Equal Rights under the Law brought the two together and changed the Constitution so that it incorporated the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln revolutionized personal freedom in the United States, and he changed the meaning of freedoms. Uh, he changed the meaning of persons as well as the meaning of freedom. He smashed the notion of human chattel. He assured the principle of personal liberty was protected by law. The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship and equal rights in the 15th granted the right to vote. Uh, the latter two post-war constitutional amendments passed after Lincoln's death, but as part of his uh, legacy. All three of these radically changed how power was and is delegated to the Constitution. 
rather than a list of limits to government authority, what Congress shall make no law respecting, these Civil War amendments are the first to specify government authority. Congress shall have the power to enforce the provision. The extent of a citizen's social, civil, and political rights remain open to debate, but the Constitution was now committed uh, the power of the federal government to the equal extension of those rights. This is a new role for government. Back in 1791, reacting to the tyranny of Great Britain, opponents of the proposed Constitution amended a bill of rights that would spell out safeguards of individual citizens. The First Amendment uh, begins, Congress shall make no law respected. After Lincoln, the Constitution defined a new birth of freedom, citizenship, and the right to vote, and gave the federal government the power to uphold individual liberty. Lincoln institutionalized positive liberty long before I think Isaiah Berlin understood this sort of positive and negative liberty. As long as Americans are interested in liberty and freedom, I think they will want to know more about Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln often spoke about the difference between two antagonistic groups who declare for liberty. Some, he said, used the word liberty to mean that each man could do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor. Others hold the word liberty mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. He proffered a parable to nail the point. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat, he said, for which the sheep thanks the shepherd as a liberator, while the wolf denounces him for the same act as a destroyer of liberty, especially as the sheep is a black one. Now, uh, In the, in the years following the Civil War and Reconstruction, ever how inadequate schools, local school we might be in practice, however unfair ordinances governing buses or movie theater, baseball stadiums or beaches might seem, however blatantly voting registration discriminated, Americans both on both sides of the racial divide can take comfort in the knowledge that the rule of law prevailed. And where there was law, the law might be changed. Where there was change, that change would be enforced with the full power of the Constitution. And I just want to conclude uh, with the words that Lincoln spoke then as today, which I think have full power as the conclusion, uh, concluding paragraph of the age of Lincoln. Lincoln recast America's purpose. His call for a new birth of freedom came to fruition in new amendments to the Constitution none of which was inevitable, all of which promised to embrace an equality of opportunity that transcended any particular and exclusionary right. Under rulings that touted separate but equal, the U.S. Supreme Court put to rest those millennial schemes of equality. Nevertheless, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments would continue to promise freedom from slavery, equal protection under the law, and the right to vote. Even as the darkness of the native began to settle over the land, a handful of believing blacks and a smaller number still of trusting whites put their faith in the law and continued to work on redrawing freedom's boundaries. In the passing of the age, Americans gave up old dreams of heavenly perfection and enshrined new hopes of material progress. Incremental, tangible, capital in dollars and dimes, full bellies and fine clothes. In place of noble statesmen and great leaders, they trumpeted clean hands and efficient administration. In place of pure heart, gentle spirit, and feminized consciences, they held up manly toil, stoic endurance, and the virtue of struggling self-interest. But in the American mind, the Civil War itself never truly ended. It was transmuted to a romantic memory, the stuff of elaborate weekend rituals of bloodless battles during which no contraband crossed enemy lines at risk of life. It flowered into a national pastime for vacationing families that took in the emotional majesty of Little Round Top and Cemetery Ridge without making sure to wrestle likewise with untold lynchings across America, whether found in the shock of genetics discovering slaves in one family or in the waste of New Orleans' devastated ninth war, the war is with us still as myth and reality both. Just as in the age of Lincoln, moral choice, democratic citizenship, and equality still mingle. Determined that the thing can and shall be done, wrote Lincoln, and then we shall find the way. And uh, I want to give people, I have gone on uh, quite a bit here on the Constitution. If you want to leave, feel free to, to do so. Because uh, that's sort of the end of that. But I have a hobby horse I want to talk to people about. And it seems to me it is really relevant here. But don't feel like you've got to stay. That is the end of the Constitution, except that it's related. The Milwaukee speech is one of my favorite speeches. 
And I think we're in a crisis in education today. You know, most of the time people talk about the Milwaukee speech, it is given about labor. But I think there's a larger meaning there just as important. And I have been so concerned of what's going on in our own country now about education. I have the opportunity to speak to people who are here, are concerned, I know, I know you're concerned and you're knowledgeable, or you wouldn't be here for a lecture like this. I know you care about the city of Milwaukee and uh, the state of Wisconsin and democracy. So I wanted to rest a moment here. It might be an oxymoron if you ever can rest at the end and speak about Lincoln and education and this Milwaukee speech. But feel free, I don't want to hold people any longer. It's not long, but it's uh, go ahead and I'll be here as long as people want to ask questions. So you won't hurt my feelings, you need to look. You can't hurt my feelings. I had five dollars. <laughs> Look, farming the age of Lincoln, when we moved, when I talked a bit earlier about, about the problems of the country, when we were moving from a farming-based economy and an artisan-based economy uh, into a manufacturing economy, it was a huge transition society, and we're going through the same thing now. We are moving from a, a manufacturing economy to a knowledge-based economy. And I'm just not sure how many ditches are to be dug or bricks to be laid or, or, or why are we cool if we don't train people for this new knowledge-based economy and education even more so as Lincoln So I think it's critical that we have education, real education, if we're going to have a democracy. In the midst of a terrible civil war, Lincoln Science Act Institute, the Moral Act, and the National Academy of Sciences. I think we desperately need the kind of leadership that gave us a Moral Act and land-grant colleges. In the 19th century, land-grant colleges were called people's colleges, farmer colleges. They were also known as democracy's colleges. It's a title I love and one I think that describes what education itself is really all about. I don't care if you're at the middle school level or in college. In the mid-1800s, when reformers began to push for better higher education, they saw the need for colleges to offer practical knowledge and more science in this developing democratic republic. Darwin's The Origin of the Species appeared in 1859, which is the very year that President James Buchanan vetoed a bill calling for land grant college. The Moral Act, I think, was an American way of saying it, as Darwin's book signified that the Western world was ready to move into a new era of inquiry. I'm going to have one more digression. I love stories and haven't told many, and this is one I am going to regret telling. It's an apocryphal story. I made, made it up. My wife tells me to never tell it. I usually know when she's here, so I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. She's right, it's disrespectful. But when I taught in Illinois, I had 750 students in the classroom. If you can believe that, that's not really teaching. And it was amazing. When I went to Coastal, uh, I had fewer students in my classroom on the Civil War. Maybe if I had named it uh, 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 the war between the states, the war in North Bridge, I might have had more. But at any rate, I had more graduate teaching assistants working with me in these small sections and doing the grading than I had students at Coastal. But what I worried most about was in a class like that, how do you teach students to think? How do you think, get them to have critical thinking skills? You know, I'm sitting here reading a lecture, they're writing it down, and really there's not much brain going between me or them and working at it. So they believed anything. And I want them to learn to think, don't just believe everything you read in the local paper, even if, even if the great Walker Cronkite, or what he's saying on television, that you know these come together as a matter of interpretation. So how do you teach this? So I came up with this little story, and, I, and it is disrespectful. It was disrespectful when I told it. It's even more disrespectful now, because Oral Roberts really has died, and Billy Graham is, is not very, very, uh, very well uh, now. Uh, and I want you to know that I sang the Billy Graham choir. I love Billy Graham, so I don't mean it disrespectful. I want his students to understand this. I would tell people about these sort of coincidences about Lincoln and Darn being born on the same day, February 12, 1809. The two great founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who were pretty good friends. I mean, even Adams helped write the Declaration of Independence. Many people don't know that, it was at his hand in it as well. And uh, I always thought Jefferson had a crush actually on Abigail, all along that maybe that had something to do with how they become bitter political engine. If you think people are being mean to each other now, you know, the Republican and Democrats or the press and other, the kind of things they said about each other were just horrible. And then as these men got older, older men, they started writing to each other in Southern Haven of you've not a friendship of real respect. And if you've never read it, it's been published, the correspondent between that is a wonderful correspondent. And when do they die? 
the exact same day of all days, July the 4th, 1826. My favorite Southern writer, Mark Twain, was born when Hades Comet comes in in 1835, and he dies and it goes out in 1910. And I'm going to say this to you, of course, you've heard last week about Billy Graham and Warren Roberts dying on the same day. They write it right now. And I said they were singing, I won't, I won't take the time to sing when the roll is called up young. Arm in arm, they're singing the roll is called up young as they head into the pearly gates and say, wait a minute, guys, we've got to check the book. And, oh, yeah, so they look. Believe it or not, they didn't make it. But being good fundamentalists and believing in the rule of law, they went to the other place. Three days after that, Satan gets on the hot line and says, uh, just like Peter, I need to talk to the Lord. We don't want to bother now. She's playing God. I don't care about God. I said, this is the hotline. They set up this, this emergency. She get the guy. She says, what's wrong? I said, you know those two guys you sent down here, uh, Roberts and Graham? I said, yeah. I said, I want you to take them back. I said, we can't do that. You know that we set up these rules millennials ago. Satan says, I don't care about your rules. I want you to know that, or, or that Billy Graham has now saved 92% of the people in hell. The poor Roberts likes a dollar and 39 cents. Have not raised enough money to air condition the whole place. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get a point across, you can't even believe what a history professor would tell you something. Like but Lincoln was about opportunity, a basis of his political platform his entire life. We have no idea where Lincoln stood on the issue of education. I did this little book, which is for sale, and uh, if people want it, I'd love to sell it to them. Well below what you can buy for it in the store. It may be the most difficult book that I've ever, ever put together. I was challenged to take the 30 most important writings of Lincoln's or speeches and show change over time. And I think it's significant. The very first one, his first uh, thing that he ever wrote, and then the Milwaukee speech, which we'll talk about briefly, are about education. The first selection was Lincoln's first known public political statement, March 9, 1832, to the people of Salem County. He's only 23 years old. He's only lived in New Salem for six months, and he announces he's a candidate for the Illinois election. It's since the only election he ever lost where people got to vote. He proclaimed education the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. Lincoln believed education promoted morale, morality, sobriety, enterprise, and industry. He said he would be gratified if he were able to contribute to the advancement of education. The Central Lincoln also includes a second lengthy endorsement of education that I'm sure you're all familiar with from September the 30th, 1859, here at Wisconsin State Agricultural Society in Milwaukee. Here Lincoln answers South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond's class race pro-slavery mud seal theory. Not many people know what a mud seal is. When I grew up as a boy in 96 South Carolina, a lot of high fences, a lot of old rail fences. The bottom rail was called the mud seal. If you ever saw a hog pen, you know why. And people would have these boots, rubber boots, and they would, you know, rake the mud off right on that bottom rail. This was, this was in fact, Hamlin's theory that every society has to have a bottom rail. If you made that bottom rail, slaves and others could sort of do more noble kind of things. And Lincoln is responding to this. Uh, incidentally, Lincoln also signed legislation to the Department of Agriculture. Now, scholars have always read the Milwaukee speech as Lincoln's defense of free labor. But I think it's equally, and I would argue even more so, Lincoln's call for universal education and underscores his belief for the need of education if you're going to have a democracy. In part, Lincoln stated, and bear with me for this long quotation, by the mud steel theory, it is assumed that labor and education are incompatible and any practical combination of them impossible. According to that theory, a blind horse upon a treadmill is a perfect illustration of what a laborer should be. All the better for being blind that he could not tread out of place or kick understandingly. According to that theory, the education of laborers is not only useless but pernicious and dangerous. In fact, it is in some sort deemed a misfortune that laborers should have heads at all. But free labor says no. Free labor argues that as the author of man makes every individual with one head, and one pair of hands, it was probably intended that heads and hands should cooperate as friends, and that particular head should direct and control that particular pair of hands. In one word, free labor insists on universal education. Lincoln understood that democracy is not static, something I'm not sure that particularly we understand today, particularly younger people, that it progresses and it also retracts, and that education is critical if we're going to have democracy in this country. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to stop there, and I'd love to take questions. You've been a great audience to to have uh, lasted this.
this long, but uh, feel free, as I said, you cannot hurt my feelings. I try to argue when I tell that story. History is an interpretation. Everything we know is an interpretation. Uh, there are certain facts that we have to work around with. The way you look at the facts is different. That's why I built the website that I did, in fact, uh, to sort of show at least how one historian, the age of Lincoln, had at least one historian sort of takes what we think of as facts and turns them and show how others think of them as different. So feel free. I hope I, I should have insulted at least one person here and made a man up to argue with me. Otherwise, I fail. So I love it. Is Jen so okay? Any questions? Uh, notwithstanding Lincoln's knowledge of the Bible, would you say he was a Christian believer or not? You know, I, I really, you know, are you a theologian? I think that is such a tough question. It's already both ways. Lincoln never, the question was, was Lincoln a Christian? His wife answered, she probably knew better than anyone, not in the orthodox way. Um, we have a number of statements about Lincoln and, and religion from Lincoln himself and a lot of others. Lincoln is uh, sort of claimed by all denominations, never joined. There's no doubt that this hard shell Baptist church that his father was part of influenced him greatly in why he knew the Bible. Uh, and Lincoln, some people will argue, well, of course, he wasn't religious because his father used to have to uh, whip him because he was a minute, uh, the minister. He, he never liked fundamentalist. Uh, religion or, or you know extremism or, or, or the sort of shouting kind of religion. But after he was a boy, he'd go out under the tree with the other kids and he would mimic uh, the, the, the minister and entertain the kids. And so his dad would whip him for it. And uh, people would take it and say, well, see, he's not religious. But if you know anything about mimics, it means he had to understand what the preacher was saying to do it. And he, he reshaped some of those words and some of the words we treasure as the most American of words and promises uh, even, even today. Uh, uh, he owned a, he paid for a pew in the Presbyterian Church, went with his wife sometime and writes about it. Uh, and he has his own letter this, this in here where he talks about he's never disdained and he had to argue when he was a young man. He belonged to a group in, in Salem, Massachusetts, where they, the, uh, they debated the uh, divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, and so those sort of things. But I often argue, as others have, you get to a deeper faith. I think through having some doubts, as Lincoln would have said, God would have given you a mind if he didn't want you or doubt if he didn't want you to, to think about it. It's interesting if you read Lincoln and the things he says, you can argue that there is a deep faith there. But read Lincoln's religion was different than the Protestant uh, sort of uh, evangelical great awakening that influenced all of America. Lincoln's theology was much more that of the Old Testament Jewish tradition of God working out corporately his history. Ironically, it's the same theology that African Americans have, and Lincoln is clear that God is using him in history. But Lincoln never says it's God's will. I challenge you to look anywhere, and I think I've read everything we know that Lincoln wrote, a lot that people think he wrote. He never does he say it is. Everybody else knew God's will. Lincoln would always say, even when the war is over, if it is God, using subjective, subjective case, if it is God's will. So but this one, that's sort of the argument on, on the theology. Uh, both Jefferson Davis and Lincoln were not seen as very religious before the war. In fact, Jefferson Davis sort of scorned it. At the end of the war, Jefferson Davis is the most devout Episcopalian his whole life is, is part of this. And I think for both men, and I think there's argument that Lincoln even before this about his faith and his relationship with God, both men had to face the consequence of their action that men were dying. And they had to find some larger cause in it that both turned to God. And there's no doubt turned to God. Well, that means that Lincoln is a Christian. It's hard, to, it's hard to say. You know, I have my own views, and, and people read my book, say, send me letters saying, oh, I'm so glad that I've got a lot of these letters. I'm so glad that I thought Lincoln would be in heaven, but now I read your book, he is. I don't quite go that far, but I'd like to think so. He said that Lincoln was very different, I think, than we often see Christians today. Lincoln was never with the saints. He stood with the sinners with a great deal of humility, very much, I think, like Jesus Christ. And one of the problems with Lincoln, of course, he's killed, you know, in the sort of Good Friday and things like that. He becomes like a Christ-like 
mystical figure, so it's hard to figure out. That, but to make it long and short, one thing I learned growing up Baptist is that uh, you never question anyone's faith or try to know. We not, don't know who's going to be in heaven and who doesn't. Uh, going to see us lose a lot of others. I don't think I can answer it long about the way, but I certainly see a man of great faith uh, who knows and uses the Bible and, and becomes a, particularly those last years, something so important to him that he knows that he's being used to work out God's will. On this website, I talk about the age of Lincoln. My wife made me put up the, the verses. Uh, you know, when I grew up in Sunday school, we know that uh, Moses sees the burning bush and God says, you know, go back to Egypt. He says, well, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't too scared to do this. He says, well, I'll go with you and I'll get Aaron to speak for it. And he does. And Jonah, you know, has his fig tree die and then he's, he gets some digestive juices in his eyes and decides I'll go to Nineveh and he does it. But the Bible is full of examples that Lincoln knows and talks about and understands of where God called people to do things and they don't do them, they either don't happen or thousands of years. And Lincoln understood that very clearly that he wasn't quite, but he knew that God was calling him to do this, preserve the union later, I think, to end slavery in a way uh, that comes very much through a faith that he felt at least in a calling with God. So that's about the best I can do to sort of, sort of uh, answer that. And his Certainly, the precepts of the Bible, Old the New Testament in particular, I think, guided his sort of understanding of right and wrong. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. We can talk off about. It. I have a, a lot stronger personal views, but the historian, I don't want to go on the record of just saying it, but I come very close. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nothing on the education. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great. Thank you.
much. Thank you.